Uh, good afternoon to everyone present here. Um, it's uh, delightful to come back to Colum every year. And this is something that I don't give it a miss every year since its inception. And um, I know that now uh, Mr. Bose also has become quite a regular and we are delighted about that because after all he is a son of the soil and he is someone whom we in the city of Kolkata are very proud of. And I think we can jointly take this opportunity to welcome you, Ms. Desai, to our city of Kolkata or Calcutta, whichever way you would like to put it. And um, it's indeed interesting, I mean, I'll plunge straight into the book. I, th I see that all three of us have a copy of Ms. Desai's book in our hands. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Mr. Bose was handed a copy to read and so was I handed a copy to read by Malavika uh, before we sort of came here this afternoon to have this session. Um, the first thing that strikes me as a person who's been teaching history in school all my life nearly now is that uh, possibly uh, this massacre at Jallianwala Bagh is something that we do talk about very often and pretty regularly in the classroom. Unlike you know, other episodes in Indian history which are not referred to or they're sort of left on the sidelines. And um, it is a very important landmark in Indian history and this year particularly is the centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre because we are talking about 13th April 1919 and we're now in January 2019. So, just to kickstart our discussion, and I'll obviously invite Mr. Bose in very soon, um, please share with us, Ms. Desai, what is it that prompted you to write a book about Jallianwala Bagh? Uh, firstly, I want to thank um, the Kolkata Literary Meet and uh, both of you for being here, sharing the platform, and of course, all of you uh, who have come here, and I'm sure there are many more enticing things to do in Kolkata. Um, and I think I'm very grateful and sort of uh, can feel the irony of sitting here in the Victoria Memorial and uh, talking about something which uh, is a great blot uh, on the British uh, name and uh, what they did in India. And one of the uh, incidents uh, or, you know, this, this particular massacre, I always feel, um, has been talked about. You're very correct. And we have it as a chapter in a lot of history books. But what uh, it, for me, it was a personal journey. And I felt that there was a lot that is still out there which lies in library books and which lies in documents, uh, particularly in the British Library, in files in the government uh, national archives in Delhi. But what has happened strangely, you know, uh, Priya Darshini, over the years, is that even though this is such uh, uh, it, this was such a big event. We say that this was the turning point of the Indian freedom struggle and so on. There have been very few books actually written by Indian writers on this event. And that is what I think was the first, uh, my first um, introduction to it is when I started looking around that I wanted an Indian perspective of what happened. Because uh, for me, uh, the discovery that my grandmother was a young uh, child at that time, she was only about uh, 10 or 12 years old, and she lived just a few streets away from, in a gully of Jallianwala Bagh, and that, evening when Dyer went in and began that bloody massacre, uh, the, the air, you know, you could, you could, uh, I could visualize what must have happened, the screams, the bullets, um, the people lying dead on the streets of Amritsar, and this, uh, you know, so many young people, women who were at home, um, would not even have known about this till they had, because there was a curfew that was also on, and after eight o'clock you could not go out. How did people get the dead bodies um, uh, out of there? And then I discovered through my research that even the electricity 
supply and the water had also been cut that evening by, of course, the good offices of General Dyer. So he really wanted to make this a, such a horrible event. So the deeper I start, the more I started researching this particular uh, incident, I found that there was a lot that I did not know in detail and I definitely felt that it deserved a book. I'm sure it deserved a better author and a better historian than me because I am not a historian. I, I am just somebody who came to it and decided to write a book as if I was somebody living in Amritsar in 1919 with limited information of what exactly was going on and suddenly found that my government, whom I trusted, the British government at that time, who I, I thought had justice and fair play, suddenly turned around and started uh, you know, killing uh, my family, members, and others in Amritsar because uh, they, they decided to go out and protest. And, uh, and also, it was a peaceful protest. It wasn't like they, had, they were armed and they were going to ask for the British to leave India. So these were the questions with which I went into researching this book. And I have to say, it was a bit of an investigative story because there were so many elements I found which hadn't as yet been mined or put together you know, in, in quite the way which I hope you will find in this book, you know. So, so there, are, uh, there are telegrams, there are documents, and there are other things which I discovered in different places which all had to be put together. And as you know, Shogato, one of the reasons being that the British had censored a lot of what came out during the Hunter Committee report uh, hearings, um, which were conducted actually even in Kolkata. They were conducted uh, some here, some in Lahore, and some in other places uh, in India. And during those, um, whatever was being taken down, and these are very authentic reports because this is all, all the officers speaking at that time. And some of, sometimes it's really scary that they could say these things in, uh, so cold-bloodedly. But a lot of this had been suppressed. So it was interesting to go back into those uh, committee reports and find material that one could look at today and then piece together. So that is why I decided that I had to somehow, this is my own um, you know, kind of effort to put together that story. One other, quickly I'll tell you another reason being because we run the Partition Museum in Amritsar, which is just about a five minutes walk from Jallianwala Bagh. And every time I used to go to Jallianwala Bagh, I would say, but you know, so many people have massacred here, but I don't really see that kind of um, you know, appearance of the Bagh everything has changed. If you look at the photographs of that period, you compare it to the photographs now, uh, everything has changed. It's more of a picnic spot when you go there. People don't really know uh, that what happened. So I think it was partly to do that. And yes, of course, the 100 years coming up, I thought uh, we should start looking at history again, because for far too long, we have looked at it from the British point of view. And I think colonial history, as other histories as well, uh, we need to take back and we need to look at them again. Maybe somebody else will do a much better book, but I do hope you will like this one. Um, um, I am, I'm going to bring in Mr. Bose here right away. But, uh, you know, I have to share this with you about, uh, you know, when I was growing up as a student. And I will never forget, you know, my memory of learning about Jalian Walabag. It didn't happen in the classroom. I remember having gone to Shantini Kiton with my parents and at the museum, there is the letter that Rabindranath Tagore wrote where he is actually telling the British the reasons why he is deciding to give up his knighthood. And I see that in the appendix two of your book, you mentioned that. I mean, you, you've sort of put the letter there for us to read. And as a child, I remember, I mean, it left this tremendous imprint on my mind, which has never gone away. And uh, I think that becomes, you know, a sign of how terrible things were. And I'm sure those who will read your book will understand when they look at, you know, those accounts that you have given of people. And particularly, I have to bring this in for those who haven't read the book. There's this beautiful, um, a, a very poignant picture of a little boy and the way he is looking at the photographer. 
he's lost his family. So, I mean, yes, definitely there are these factors of people who were there and what happened to them. Mr. Vos, I want to bring you in here for you to share your thoughts with us as you have read the book too. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Kishwar for writing a, a very moving book. Uh, she doesn't give up any of uh, the academic rigor that is uh, required to mine the sources. Uh, and yet, um, you know, um, it is a haunting uh, book. Um, and uh, as you've just mentioned, Priyadoshini, um, uh, you know, there are two appendices to the book, uh, both extremely valuable. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai's uh, introduction in 1920 to a contemporary account of what had happened in Jallianwala Bagh. And this is what he writes. The Punjab tragedy of 1919 is an event of historical importance. It is a chapter of the world's history, a bloody chapter albeit, dyed red by the high priests of imperialism, which will retain its freshness whenever the future generations of men and women happen to read it. And I really do think uh, that uh, Kishwar's account has that uh, freshness, which uh, Lajpat Rai uh, refers to. And as for um, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, letter, uh, resigning his uh, knighthood, um, you know, th the address is a little too deferential. But there is one sentence which is very powerful, and it is this. The time has come when badges of honor make our shame glaring in their incongruous context of humiliation. And I, for my part, wish to stand shorn of all special distinctions by the side of those of my countrymen who, for their so-called insignificance, are liable to suffer degradation not fit for human beings. And the degradation was awful. Uh, it wasn't just that innocent men, women, and children were gunned down in uh, this enclosed uh, park. Uh, there were orders given uh, to flog uh, people, including very young children, I would say. There were crawling orders that were given there was a uh, bombing from the air in, in Gujranwala. Uh, so uh, you saw British imperialism in all its savagery uh, in the spring of uh, 1919. Things could have been much worse, as this book shows. Um, you know, uh, this is a book that uh, uses uh, both the Hunter Committee report, but also the unofficial report produced by the Indian National Congress. Uh, there were three very distinguished members of that committee. Madan Mohan Malviya was the chair. Uh, Motilal Nehru and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi were members. And you find um, that uh, uh, Reginald Dyer had actually brought uh, uh, armored cars with him, uh, which were loaded with machine guns. And when C.P. Sethalvad questioned him as to whether he was would have been prepared to use the machine guns, he said yes. Uh, th there was a very narrow lane leading up to Jallianwala Bagh, so the armored car could not enter. So just imagine that simple, simple rifles, uh, you know, firing, what, something like 1,650 rounds caused the casualties and fatalities. But imagine Dyer being able to bring in uh, his, uh, his machine guns. So it could have been much worse. And um, I have visited uh, Jalian Balabag, and I, I see what Kishwar means uh, when, uh, when she says that the atmosphere is quite different. On my very first visit to Amritsar, I made sure that I first visited the Golden Temple in the evening, and then the next morning I went to visit Jalian Balabag. It was the spring, it was early May, early summer, I would say, and there were beautiful sort of red flowers on the you know, uh, trees, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, people were having a good time as they must have uh, been doing uh, before uh, Dyer came with his uh, forces. Uh, the, the only um, marks that you have of the terrible tragedy are the 
bullet marks uh, in the walls, the brick, brick walls. Um, and, you know, Amritsar is a fascinating city. Um, you know, Kishwar has to be congratulated also for setting up uh, a partition museum in Amritsar. We haven't yet done so in, uh, in Bengal. We ought to do something about it. Um, we haven't remembered, we have a Victoria Memorial here, but we don't have a memorial to the uh, three million plus victims of the Bengal famine, a man-made famine in more senses than one. We do not have a memorial uh, to those innocents who died uh, in partition violence in, uh, in 1947. Amritsar is fascinating, you know, uh, Kishwar has also done some work on Sadat Hassan Manto. It was Manto's city, and he does have a wonderful story, again, a very gripping story uh, that is set in the context of... Uh, the Masha. Uh, yes, of, of, of 1919, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Amritsar uh, uh, massacre. So, I mean, this is a truly wonderful book, and um, I have... I don't have much to add, excepting that I think in time we should have some discussion uh, of the aftermath uh, of, uh, of Amritsar, uh, the bonds that were forged between uh, Bengal and Punjab. Our destinies seem to have got intertwined, and I could say more about that, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I will let Priyadarshini direct the conversation in whatever <laughs> no, direction she pleases. in fact, I mean, when uh, Ms. Desai and I were walking here, uh, we just were talking about exactly that. And what you did mention, sir, she actually echoed the very same sentiments because she said that uh, it's strange, but Punjab and Bengal really have a lot in common with regard to the development of the graph of the nationalist struggle. And uh, I mean, these happen to be two states which did get partitioned when the partition of India really happened in 1947. And um, I, I, I do tend to, you know, really wholeheartedly support what you're saying that here, particularly in Bengal, I mean, which has been the hotbed of Indian nationalism right from the beginning, we, we possibly haven't done enough, which we should do in the future. But um, I want to just bring in something else here. Uh, which struck me when I was, you know, going through the pages of your writing. Um, we do know, I mean, those of us who are students of history and those who are scholars of the subject and for others who might not, that possibly 1919-1920 uh, is the last phase in the Indian national movement which will see Hindu-Muslim unity. And... Um, you know, because Gandhi will lead the nation very soon into the non-cooperation struggle. So uh, how would you reflect on that? Because that does, you yeah. know, find echoes in your writing. Um, well, for me, that was a very, very important and valuable discovery. And I do want to echo again what you have been saying about the similarity of the graphs of Bengal and Punjab. And um, the one thing I also want to say is that uh, Raj Bihari Bose was also uh, uh, positioned at one stage, uh, stationed in, uh, in Amritsar, where then uh, O'Dwyer, who was the lieutenant governor at that time, managed to you know, get hold of a plot which he said he was going to uh, be uh, undergoing some revolutionary activity there and then uh, got rid of him at that point or rather uh, both uh, left. So, uh, but to come back to the Hindu-Muslim unity, I found this was a very key uh, discovery for me because um, this is the, this is actually Gandhi's first really large successful satyagraha, which he undertakes, which is against the uh, Rowlett Acts. And he would like everybody in the country to get united, to get behind it, to have hartals, to have a peaceful uh, non-cooperation, if you like uh, uh, to call it that, uh, to shut down shops, to shut down all establishments, and to show in, in a peaceful way their resistance to this draconian act, which as you know, uh, when uh, people said it was a black act, no Delhi, uh, na Delhi, na Vakil, na Appeal, 
once you were caught under the Rowlett Act, it had, you know, it would ensure that you would get no justice whatsoever. And why did they bring it? A lot of the hearings of the act again were right here in Kolkata. Rowlett came here and the act was designed, uh, taking into account all the people who were behind bars, some of them who still remain nameless and faceless, young students mostly who were locked up for uh, sedition against the king. And this was something that they wanted to see uh, that would be in place because the Defense of India Act, which had been in place uh, during the um, World War, which had just gotten over in 1918, was no longer applicable. So Gandhi started this movement. He thought this was a terrible act and people should become aware of it. What happened in Punjab, of course, was that you saw that the Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, everybody got behind this act and decided to go out and protest. One of the places in Amritsar, which was a popular place of protest, was Jallianwala Bagh because it was a community space and people would often gather there. The leaders, of course, uh, Saifuddin Kichlu, a Muslim, Satyapal, a Hindu, they came together and they were leading this agitation. But this was not the only place where we saw this kind of unity. We're talking about divided India. So there are also many instances which are coming in from Lahore, where the Badshahi Mosque, some of you who have been to Lahore may be familiar with that. Uh, they, this became a meeting ground. And Horniman, who was another journalist who was recording things in Bombay, said that it's, it's astonishing to see this because uh, Muslims are going into temples, Hindus are going into mosques, they're using these as meeting places. And on Ram Naomi, which was in Amritsar, which was being celebrated on a 9th of April, which is just four days before the massacre, you have this amazing spectacle of hin Hindus and Muslims jointly taking out a procession, and they are together. And you then see the other side of the story when you look at the documents which emerge from that per period, which are the British documents, and you read of how fearful the DC was watching this. Nothing had happened. Not a sh the, 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 you know, they had not harmed anyone. They, this was just a peaceful, joyous occasion. But Irving, who's the DC at that time, gets completely petrified. The same thing happens even in Lahore. People are scared. I mean, Hindus, Muslims coming together, what is going to happen to the British? So then you have incidents uh, which are again recorded in other places of Punjab where pork, you know, th this was followed uh, later on to the letter in 1947. So where pork is thrown into a mosque and where uh, just outside a temple, a calf is found strung up. Fortunately, people uh, don't take it seriously. But as the situation worsens, especially after the massacre and after martial law is imposed on the very large innocent population of Punjab, uh, that is when the British begin to try and divide the population again very, very systematically. So, uh, Shogutu, I, I'm sure you've come across these instances. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a, a very uh, important theme of uh, Hindu-Muslim unity and in the context of Punjab, Hindu-Muslim Sikh uh, unity in the uh, anti-colonial struggle. Um, uh, what is quite fascinating is to see that uh, Hindus and Sikhs were joining Muslims in cries of Allahu Akbar uh, at these uh, um, anti-colonial meetings. And uh, that's not surprising because uh, the closest comrades of Mahatma Gandhi in those days were the Ali brothers, Shaukat and Muhammad Ali. And Shaukat Ali and Mahatma Gandhi had decided that there should be three national cries or slogans. One would be Allahu Akbar. The second, uh, Gandhi said, could be either Bharat Mata Ki Jai or Bande Mataram. But he said he preferred Bande Mataram because that would be a graceful recognition of the emotional and intellectual superiority of Bengal. And the third national slogan would be Hindu Musalman Ki Jai, because what is India without the union of the Hindu and Muslim hearts? Uh, so uh, it's not just in 1919 during that Satyagraha, but also during the nonviolent non-cooperation movement uh, that Gandhi was able to forge uh, Hindu-Muslim unity with the help of uh, pro-Khilafat uh, Muslims. And in addition to the uh, places of worship in Amritsar and Lahore, 
there were gigantic mass meetings in the Jama Masjid in Delhi, which uh, Gandhi referred to, Swami Shraddhanand of Punjab, was coming and speaking from the pulpit of the Jama Masjid after Friday prayers. And uh, Priyadarshini, I mean, I, I don't think you're entirely right in suggesting that uh, Hindu-Muslim unity faded after the early 1920s. You're right to the extent that uh, Muslims were not as enthused by Gandhi's civil disobedience movement of the early 1930s, excepting in the Northwest Frontier Province. And even in the Quit India movement, Muslim participation was somewhat limited. And that is why when uh, Mahatma Gandhi was in uh, Noakhali in 1946, uh, or in Kolkata and Delhi in 1947, he kept harking back to the days of the non-cooperation and Khilafat movement, 1919 to 1922, saying that in those days, he and the Ali brothers went around the country like blood brothers, preaching the message of unity. And the other uh, historical uh, episode, which recurred constantly in practically everything that he was saying between late 45 and January 1948, was uh, the, um, uh, uh, the the Azad Hind movement led by Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, and he kept saying that here was one leader who had successfully uh, united all of the religious communities of India in the climactic moment of uh, of India's freedom struggle. So he was looking back, uh, and then also talking about the wartime experience of the. Uh, of the Azad Hind Forge, and he met their INA prisoners both in the Kabul lines and in the Red Fort in 1946. Finally, I mean, it's often pointed out that Jalian Balabag um, marked um, perhaps a final psychological alienation between the colonizer and the colonized, between the British masters and the Indian subject uh, populace. But it's also important to note that a figure like Mahatma Gandhi shifted ground dramatically. During the period of the First World War, he had gone about recruiting soldiers for Britain's Indian Army. But during the non-cooperation movement, if you read his articles in Young India, um, uh, he was basically writing um, that uh, the Indian soldier uh, was being used as a hired assassin. Th those were the words that uh, Mahatma Gandhi used in one of the articles for which he was charged with sedition eventually in March 1922. And in that article, the first reference was to Jallianwala Bagh, uh, but then he talked about Chandpur, uh, he talked about uh, Egypt, he talked about Mesopotamia, uh, and he basically was writing the article in the context of supporting the Ali brothers and various others who were being tried in Karachi for having asked Indian soldiers not to serve the British anymore. And he basically was saying that this is a satanic government from which all of us should withdraw any kind of, uh, of cooperation. So there is one other feature that we need to note, which is that, you know, the fingers on the triggers, even in Jallianwala Bagh, were those of Indian soldiers serving the British King Emperor. And that was, I think, the worst aspect, the most corrosive aspect uh, of the abjection of colonial rule. And Mahatma Gandhi referred to the Indian soldier being used as a hired assassin. But while he was able to rally the civilian masses, uh, he wasn't quite able to break the loyalty of the Indian soldier. That happened during the Second World War uh, under the leadership of his rebellious son. And it became clear, you know, after the end of the Second World War, that it would not be possible for the British to hold India anymore uh, using, you know, Indian soldiers. Can I, can I just add one thing? Because uh, Punjab, as you know, uh, actually supplied large numbers of the soldiers that went out uh, to fight in World War I. 
And uh, so when you talk about the hand on the trigger, uh, you know, ostensibly, of course, there was Dyer as well. He was standing right there. Now, for me, when I was writing this book, I realized that the role that Dyer played was awful. It was terrible. But he only enters the scene for about a week or 10 days. Before that, you have the Lieutenant Governor, O'Dwyer, who is actually responsible for a large number of, uh, of cases of oppression which have already taken place in Punjab by the time the Jallianwala Bagh massacre happens. And he is largely supportive of all the things which go on after the massacre, which is when people really realize the true horror of the colonial rule that they have to undergo because that's when you know all kinds of as you were saying terrible orders are passed but to look at how the recruitment was done for the army so you cannot actually say that all of punjab was happy because in my book i have instances of parents begging you know what they had done was they had put quotas for districts. O'Dwyer had put quotas and said that we have to supply so many hundreds of thousands of soldiers and each district has a quota and then he would have an agent who was actually paid to go, go out there. So he had a wonderful uh, system set in of rewards that if you were able to get in a certain number of soldiers, this would be your reward. And then you would also get titles like Rai Bahadur and so on and so forth. So now we have to look at all those titles also with a, with a little bit of suspicion. But, so basically, he he did all this because, as you will find in my book, I have quoted him, and he proudly says this as well, that he has understood the mind of the Orientals. The Orientals love titles. They love them, you to go out there and give them all kinds of rewards, in return for which they will give you, uh, you know, what is, what is the flower of the Punjabi youth and so on. So he had, you know, finessed this. But I also want to say that whilst all these atrocities are going on in Punjab, and particularly in Amritsar, which becomes, during the massacre, like a concentration camp. People are deeply unhappy. It's not that they have just suddenly become unhappy after Gandhi's uh, Satyagraha begins. They have already seen you know, the Ghadar Party movement. There's been a lot of restlessness. Because why? Because the same soldiers who go abroad, they see that we are fighting for this country's, for the British freedom. And we're fighting for the allies. And we're being used as cannon fodder. But when we come home, our own people are oppressed. So when they went, after they came back from abroad, they also brought these ideas, particularly in Punjab, of liberty, you know, of freedom. And they wanted their own people to be free. So particularly in that period, when Gandhi, Satyagrabi, and so all these ideas began to take shape and began, it was not, as you said, it was not still a cry for freedom. It was just that, can you, can this, uh, can this particular act not be passed? So there, there was a huge amount of restlessness which was taking place in Punjab, but O'Dwyer at that time was in the process of actually, uh, he was on the verge of retiring and going back. He did not want to leave with this kind of blot against his uh, record, his so-called peaceful record in Punjab. And if you read my book, you will see that while the, whilst all this is happening in Amritsar, you will find that he's attending parties, he's attending farewell dinners, and it's in Lahore. It's as though nothing is happening in Punjab at that time. So there are two different uh, things which are going on. One is the ruler who really does not know that the people are restless and, uh, you know, and would like a change in the environment. And the other side is, of course, the people themselves who are participating in this uh, movement, but then are being ruthlessly oppressed at the same time. Uh, yeah, and, um, and of course, as you say, Odwaya was planning a grand exit from Lahore while these terrible things were happening a few miles away in Amritsar. Uh, Odwa, of course, was uh, uh, assassinated two decades later by Udham Singh. Uh, you seem to be a bit uncertain, Kishwar, whether Udham Singh was actually present and was a witness uh, uh, at Jallianwala Bagh or whether he had simply uh, heard about it. Uh, do, do you want to say a wor word on that point? Bec there was a documentary uh, shown on BBC or one of the British channels some years ago which claimed that Udham Singh had been a direct witness uh, of, the, of the massacre. But you haven't 
found well, compelling we, evidence. I, I haven't found any evidence, so I would hesitate to say that, but he was definitely an orphan in, uh, in Amritsar. Uh, but we are not sure whether he was at the Bagh at that time. But certainly, a lot of the revolutionaries from Punjab, including Bhagat Singh and others, and Udham Singh, were directly inspired by the killings uh, and the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh, you know, and, to, and decided that they needed to take revenge for that uh, terrible act. Um, I've been told already that I need to open it up for questions because I think we're running on a tight schedule. Um, yes, sir. Uh, could we have a mic for him? Uh, I live in Amritsar and my office is right on Bang on Jallianwala Bagh. And uh, my uh, cousin of my grandfather, he was in that uh, assembly and fortunately because he was uh, at a good height, he could cross the wall and escape. What I am trying to say is this, that Jallianwala Bagh still today is the epitome of national integration. From my office window, I can see that uh, people from South India, people from Gujarat, people from Assam, they come with garlands and put the garlands there and uh, reverentially they bow down and uh, it is a great source of national integration today even. Uh, thank you. Um, I think my friend here, she has a question. I just want to mention two things. Uh, having gone through your book, I discovered that you haven't uh, uh, brought in the vernacular uh, uh, periodicals or newspapers or journals contemporary uh, because they are, I think, they would give you an authentic voice which is not necessarily, since it's not immediately read by the Britishers, it wouldn't be so censored. Why I'm saying this is because I have found in Bengal in 1919, just after Jallianwala Bagh, a huge account of the entire history that you have written in, written in Bengali in Bharati. And um, Shorno, um, which was uh, editor, editor was of course Shorno Kumari Devi, who's of the Tagore family. Her daughter, Shorla Devi Chodrani, was in Lahore at that time. And she, and it is uh, said, I don't know how far this is true, that she's the one who informed Rabindranath Thakur about the incident, which may have prompted whatever. So I don't know, I, I haven't uh, found evidence of that. But my question is, have you looked into the uh, contemporary uh, sources there? because it, she knew in Lahore immediately. Yeah. And um, yeah. uh, no, you're quite right. Uh, thank you for that uh, intervention. And we would love to look at uh, the material that you have discovered, because this is an ongoing process. You know, what we are also doing is uh, we have set up an exhibition, which is in the Partition Museum itself, because in the Bagh, you do not have so much detail about what happened. But whilst, whilst I was researching this book, I found so many documents and photographs and things. Actually, this book could have been six times the size it is. But I had publishers who said that, please keep it short, because that's what people want to read these days. And so we have a supporting exhibition which is going on, which actually is now going to travel around the country. And it's also going to the UK, because there, too, people need to be educated. So it's going to Manchester Museum and so on. And there we have these documents. We have the, uh, you know, the um, uh, Urdu newspapers and other accounts. Some of it, I would still say, were censored, because we have come across books which were not um, available at that time. We found one copy or one little poem or, you know, things like that. But it may be, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, editors who were working at that time, there is documented evidence to show that they were like the Punjabi, the Tribune, and so on. I mean, they were put in jail. They were all behind bars because the idea during the martial law was to actually, yes, take care of the middle class. O'Dwyer thought it was the middle class that was really leading this uh, rebellion against the British, and they needed to be put in place. So a lot of the newspaper editors were put behind bars. A lot of the lawyers, uh, you know, and other people who were their traders and so on, which is a big burgeoning, you know, middle class doctors, they were all locked up. So 
after that, what I have discovered is that a lot of people did not actually want to talk about it anymore because they felt that their family members could be impacted. So writing was done perhaps by some a few brave people, but it only happened after martial law was lifted. So that was after you know two three months because no news reports were actually allowed to come out of uh, uh, Punjab at that time. And there are a few scattered documents, but if you've got any, please do tell us. It's an ongoing exercise. Thank uh, you. I'll just share what Ma'am said because the second part of what she was referring to is very important. She was asking uh, Ms. Desai that whether there are any contemporary sources available, not memoirs, that have been written of the massacre thereafter. Ma'am, your question. Yes. Uh, the Holocaust was terrible, and uh, but we have not been allowed to forget it. Every year, movies are made, books are written. Now, the Jallianwala Bagh and, other, and the partition of India. I mean, I think outside India, hardly anybody is aware of the atrocities that were committed. Is it because we're very magnanimous or we are callous? Um, Shagata, you want to answer that one? <laughs> well, uh, I, I imagine um, we should not forget, but perhaps we are a little too forgiving. As I mentioned, even the famine, for which I think the British colonial state was entirely culpable, uh, is not you know, remembered in the same way. It, this was a catastrophe in which uh, anywhere between three and a half and 3.8 million people uh, died. So, I mean, it is our duty to make sure that uh, subsequent generations act, know their history, and it's important to do it in both India and in, in Great Britain uh, at this point, because the current generation of uh, the British people cannot be held responsible for what uh, their uh, forefathers had done. Uh, if I may, I would like to take this opportunity, since Bhagat Singh was only mentioned in passing, to say uh, just a few words about the continuing connection uh, between Bengal and Punjab. You know, Bhagat Singh shot uh, Saunders, the British police officer, after a terrible uh, Lati charge against Lala Lajpat Rai in October 1928, and the assassination took place in November. And then, uh, you know, early next year, in April uh, of uh, 1929, uh, it was Bhagat Singh and Botukeshwar Dotto who threw the small bombs and some leaflets inside the Central Legislative Assembly. And when they were all in jail, again, you know, uh, we had Bengali revolutionaries and Punjabi revolutionaries together in Lahore jail. They had spent time in the Andaman as well, of the nearly 500 prisoners, political prisoners in Andaman, uh, since the Swadeshi days, uh, about 370 were Bengali and nearly 100 were Punjabi. And um, in that hunger strike, of course, it was a Bengali who fasted for more than two months and died. This was Jyotin Das. And, um, and Shubhash Chandra Bose took charge of uh, Jyotin Das's funeral here in Kolkata. His body was brought back from Lahore uh, to, uh, to Kolkata. And then Shubhash Chandra Bose traveled in October 1929 to Punjab and addressed the students uh, of, uh, of Punjab. I might add, because this is rather a forgotten episode, that of the members of the Central Legislative Assembly who tried to speak in support of the hunger strikers in Lahore jail were, of course, Motilal Nehru and M.R. Jayakar, but the most eloquent speech in defense of Bhagat Singh and his comrades at that time was given by Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, because he thought that the British were making a travesty of criminal uh, jurisprudence by trying to try them in absentia while they were uh, on, uh, on, a, uh, on a fast. And again, we mentioned Saifuddin Kichlu. Uh, he continued to be a very major figure and uh, in uh, uh, March 1931, after the Gandhi Irwin truce was reached, and there was an attempt to resile from the Purna Swaraj resolution, uh, there was, of course, Shubhash Chandra Bose saying that we must be, remain committed to complete independence. But one of the two other uh, young leaders who signed the independence manifesto was none other than Saifuddin Kichlu of, of Punjab. So there are all these um, uh, examples of uh, comradeship uh, between uh, Bengali and Punjabi uh, freedom fighters. So there is this 
common or shared history of revolutionary struggle against the British Empire, but also the rather more sad history of these two uh, provinces with slight Muslim majorities, uh, which uh, you know, suffered the partitioners' acts in August 1947. Can, can I just uh, quickly just add to this uh, but what you said about, uh, you know, memorializing and remembering? And uh, this was, again, I think one of the big reasons why I went into this, into writing, just like with the Partition Museum. Pathetic. So we are redoing the museum in Jallianwala Bagh also. But what I want to say today is that, you know, uh, the, we have only 379 names, recorded names, of the people who died. And we all know from all accounts that there were thousands. The fact that we did not have, it's taken us 100 years. Now, you know, like that gentleman spoke about his, uh, you know, uh, ancestor being there. We are doing this now. But, you know, it's never too late. We, I really request all of you that if you have any partition survivors, Janiawala Bagh uh, stories, anything to tell us, please do contact us because this is the only way. I think it has to be ultimately the people who do it because both of these were, uh, you know, situations that uh, impacted just ordinary people of both Punjab and Bengal. So the rulers are not interested, but we are. <laughs> No, I, I don't know why we should uh, leave everything to the government. I mean, I think as people who are uh, somewhat uh, more caring about our history, perhaps our you know forefathers did not have the time to do that, but uh, because they were busy with other issues and problems. But now that we can, let's all join in. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should look at just the negatives. Let's just try and look at it positively and say, let's get together. Let's try and at least remember them now. C uh, civil society initiatives are always better than government initiatives. Uh, there's a question here, uh, the lady here, in the second row. Uh, sir, you ask and then she can take. Uh, my name is Anand Varma. Sir, could you hold the mic a little closer to you? More close? <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Anand Varma. My question is to Professor Bose because it's regarding history. See, do you think that uh, uh, the British rule, starting from 1858 onwards, had some kind of a legitimacy in the minds of Indian public to, uh, till uh, Jallianwala Bagh or some other thing happened when in general people, uh, the, the feeling changed totally. It could perhaps be, uh, uh, you know, partition of Bengal or the First World War or Jallianwala Bagh or combination of all these things when things change completely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, there were, uh, you know, moderate leaders uh, of, of the Indian National Congress uh, who in the late 19th century would be critical of British rule, but uh, often describe it as un-British rule. Uh, and uh, so I think there was a bit of uh, internalizing of uh, the... Uh, 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 ideology of the liberalism of uh, empire. My sense is that uh, in many parts of India, the alienation came sooner than uh, 1919. You can think about the tribal revolts, uh, let's say around 1899, 1900, and already during the Swadeshi period, 1905, 1906, uh, there were many uh, Indian freedom fighters uh, who thought that uh, the legitimacy of British rule had been undermined, they began to make a case for what was called in those days a severance of the British connection. Uh, but I think uh, Jallianwala Bagh, 1919, uh, was in fact a turning point, uh, not just among uh, large numbers of Indians, but also for the man who became the towering leader of the freedom struggle, Mahatma Gandhi. Yes, ma'am. Um, this, if you forgive me, is more of an observation and less of a question. Uh, we've been talking about the travesty of uh, British jurisprudence, both when we were discussing the Rowlett Act and when we were talking about the trial of General Dyer many years later. 
you did mention, Ms. Desai, right at the beginning that it's strange that we are having this discussion in the Victoria Memorial. But I'd like to draw your attention to an even greater irony. This entire discussion is taking place almost uh, beneath the feet of Warren Hastings, uh, who in fact was responsible for the setting up of the Supreme Court, of the very first establishment of the Supreme Court. And if that is not enough, if you look carefully on either side of Warren Hastings, there are two statues, one of a Hindu Pandit and the other of a Muslim Malvi, who were supposed, and this is a very iconic sculpture because they were actually supposed to advise uh, Warren Hastings on the uh, tenets of Hindu and Muslim law on which, in fact, the Supreme Court was supposed to be established. And I really can't help but be struck by this irony that we are discussing such terrible blots which then happened thereafter. So that is one point. And uh, the second point that I thought I would just uh, bring up is, uh, you know, there is this uh, strange kind of a uh, movement where particularly Indian people demand apologies for various things that have happened in history. And one of those is, in fact, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Uh, I was very, very curious to know what Dr. Bose and what you think uh, of this. Do you think in any way it would, uh, it would have any role to play in the way we perceive this uh, incident in our history? Ken, I think that the first observation was marvelous, and you know, it, it just brings home the whole discussion to the point where we can understand you know, how Warren Hastings would have started and where we ended up eventually with the British Empire. But I also want to say one thing very quickly, is that it was the way the empire was run as well. You know, by the British, by the white British, and the disdain whether they have this Malvi or they have the Pandit, I mean, that's um, besides the point. The disdain with which they held Indians, the natives, whose lives were very, very cheap indeed. I mean, as you know, for many years, you could kill an Indian and just get away with it. You didn't even have to go to jail or uh, face trial. Um, so now uh, to come to the point of the apology, the reason why I just wanted to say a few words before Shogatu speaks is because I used to believe, like um, we've just been discussing, that of course the present generation of British are not responsible for what happened, and therefore to demand an apology of the present rulers, I mean, what nonsense is this? But I have now changed my stance quite substantially, and that is because after having gone through what I went through when I was writing this book, I have to say it, it was one of the most painful books to write, the amount I must have wept because, literally, because Amritsar was a concentration camp and the kind of atrocities, I mean, we haven't even gone into all the details as yet, you know, what was done and what was done to the population and the humiliation and, 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 and how they used to say, oh, these people are slaves, they'll do whatever you want them to do. This was us. This was all about us. So I do believe that the reason behind that apology now is also a, resta a statement today of India's prestige, of our self-confidence. Because at that time when we had to crawl, we crawled, you know? And now we don't need to do that. We can look back at history and say that, no, you were wrong. You, you know, maybe it was a different generation. So obviously they're not going to be apologizing for themselves. They're going to be apologizing for what their ancestors did. So it's very much like the slavery, because literally we were slaves. I mean, our, when I wrote this book, I realized we were slaves. How, how foolish I am to think that we were free. You know, we were not. So I think there is a sense of uh, bringing that analogy in. So I have to say that now I'm on that side because we need to get that back. You know, you need to get that, um, and not just for ourselves, but all those innocents that, were, that died and were whipped and were humiliated and were hanged or sent off to Andamans. For what? For just organizing a protest? So I think they, there, has to be, um, there has to be something, some payback, and maybe I, I strongly believe, even though I'm married to uh, somebody in the House of Lords, 
you know? <laughs> and we are actually organizing a debate in the House of Lords now because the House of Commons had actually uh, taken a stance against Dyer, but the House of Lords has practically exonerated him. So we have requested that there should be another debate, you know, and let's, let's look at that once again, you know? You know, um, Warren Hastings wasn't as bad as his successors. Uh, there's quite a good book uh, on this period of uh, Company Raj by Robert Travers, uh, which shows that uh, Hastings at least was respectful of uh, Indian uh, learning. Uh, he got a very bad press because he was impeached, and Edmund Burke made that stirring speech, uh, cataloging uh, all his uh, crimes and misdemeanors. But there was much greater racism in the Calcutta Supreme Court led by Elijah Impe. Cornwallis, Wellesley began to have a clearly defined sense of racial superiority. And I think Crown Raj, post-1857, 1858, uh, was far worse uh, than what we saw uh, under the East India Company. And uh, for some of the biggest tragedies of the 20th century, uh, we must hold you know, Curzon, who, who built the Victoria Memorial, and Mountbatten uh, uh, responsible. So we, we have to understand that there were different phases of British uh, colonial rule. Now, on the question of uh, apology, um, uh, it is um, very difficult to extract an apology from a, a, a government uh, or which may be reluctant. However, we have had some recent examples of apologies, Justin Trudeau decided uh, to apologize on, the, on behalf of the Canadian government uh, for turning back the Komagata Maru from Vancouver Harbor on the eve of First World War. And I think that gesture was appreciated uh, by the Indian people and also the Indian diaspora. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can, we can uh, expect a British government in the age of Brexit uh, to be broad-minded uh, enough uh, to apologize uh, for the uh, terrible massacre that took place in Jallianwala Bagh on its 100th anniversary. It would be good if that apology came, uh, but I think we as an Indian people have to be dignified about it uh, and just make sure that people don't forget uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the humiliation that we had suffered uh, during colonial rule. You know, most of us in this room were, in this uh, uh, quadrangle, were born, you know, after uh, the British quit India. And I keep hearing from my mother even today that you will not understand how we felt uh, being ruled uh, by, by the British. So I think at least some of that sense, some of that feeling needs to be communicated to the current generation. Um, I'm really sorry, but I think we've already overshot our time and um, where sentiments about the nationalist struggle are to be spoken about, you will always see that we as Indians feel very strongly about such things. And uh, obviously, as I would echo what Mr. Bose just said that it is our responsibility to communicate this to the future generations because, as he said rightly, we are all uh, post-independence people, but it is our responsibility to carry this message forward. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience, and I'm sure you can catch up with Ms. Desai after her session is over because I already see that the speakers of the next session are waiting extremely patiently. Uh, and yes, Ms. Desai tells me to tell all of you, do read her book. That's her plea to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh -huh.